everyone, and thank you for taking the time to join us for this webinar. This is our first in a series, and so welcome on behalf of the Pan-Caribbean Partnership on HIV and AIDS, PANCAP. This series will focus on the 1990 and treat all with several objectives, uh, mainly to understand the status of the regional response, and particularly in relation to 1990 and treat all. Um, linked to this, the webinars will facilitate a greater understanding of the barriers, challenges, and gaps in the regional response. Importantly, discussions of our achievements and sharing of experiences through case studies and best practices will facilitate addressing some of these challenges at the national as well as regional level. Our technical experts will also share with you their thoughts on key strategies for the region in scaling up of the 90s. Based on the topics, experts will present and serve as resource persons for our discussion. Additionally, the technical presentations will be complemented with a successful experience from the field. Uh, with that as a background, a few logistic and operational things to note before we get into the presentation. Firstly, please know that your mics will be muted. They are muted. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to write those down in the sidebar. Um, we will address these during the question and answer segment, which is at the end of the webinar. Um, secondly, in terms of the flow, we will take all three presentations and there'll be one question and answer segment at the end. Again, please type your questions in. Um, and finally, I'd like to let you know that the webinar will be recorded and shared, at the Pan Pan Cup, shared on the PANCUP website for the benefit of the greater partnership. Um, so specifically on today's webinar, we're focusing on the first 90, and that is the 90% of persons living with HIV tested and know their HIV status. Our first speaker this afternoon is no stranger to any one of us, Mr. Derek Springer is the director of the Pan-Caribbean Partnership on HIV and AIDS Coordinating Unit, the PCU, for almost four years. Uh, under his leadership, there has been significant achievements of regional public goods, um, and maybe we can have a separate webinar at, on that at some point. Importantly, though, uh, Derek has been working with the HIV epidemic and response from the very inception in our region, and that is just a quote and number, more than 25 years. He therefore brings to the region as the director of the PCU a wide ranging experience. I'm pleased to invite Mr. Springer to speak to you on the importance of stronger partnerships for better results. Uh, over to you, Derek. No, where is it? There's nothing to say. You were your insurance doctor, right? No, I can't hear anybody.
No, it's all right. Okay. Hello. Okay, hello, good afternoon. Um, this is Derek Springer here, the director of PanCap. There were some technical glitches, but we have resolved them. I want to begin by welcoming each of you to this webinar and to thank Shanti and the Timothy and the Knowledge for Health team for coordinating this effort. I believe it's important for me to frame my intervention within the context of this very successful Caribbean HIV and AIDS partnership, which we call PANCAP. I, I know that you're all aware that PANCAP has achieved significant results because of our unique partnership model, which provides a voice for all partners, irrespective of who they are. And our model is inclusive of very diverse groups from government to grassroots CSOs that truly understand the day-to-day -day challenges faced by their constituency. And therefore, the Knowledge for Health project is premised on the understanding that we will use the PANCAP model of part partnership model. We have acknowledged that key partners in facilitating testing of our populations, including men who have sex with men, sex workers, transgender, youth, migrants, are in fact our national AIDS program as well as our civil society partners. And therefore I believe that what we are in fact doing through this webinar and other activities under the Knowledge for Health project is strengthening existing partnerships and building new ones, such as our public-private partnership, to leverage the comparative advantage of the private sector's human resource expertise yes. and financial and I have no doubt that stronger partnerships with the right partners at the right time will enable us to achieve better results for our countries and our region. I therefore encourage all of you to work with us to build stronger and more diverse partnerships for better results. And therefore, I now hand you over to the next presenter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you so much um, for that, Derek. Um, I think I think that was good. I, I liked I like the words of the partnership being unique, unique, and inclusive. And we do look forward um, to having much more of PANCAP on some of our webinars. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to introduce the second speaker. Um, Mr. Roger McLean is a research fellow at the Center for Health Economics at the University of the West Indies. Um, Roger, like Derek, also brings to the region many years of public health experience and will speak to us today on scaling up of the regional response in relation to the first 90. Good afternoon. Um, is everyone hearing me? I'm assuming. Thanks, Roger. Uh, we are. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you again. Um, I'd like to formally thank um, Shanti and Derek and the team from Panca PCU and the, the Knowledge for Health um, group for putting together this very important uh, initiative. I think opportunities to continue the role of, of sensitizing and providing a forum for exchange and sharing of experiences would always be a key feature of any effort of this nature. Um, in the interest of time, I, I will just go straight into the presentation. I've been asked to speak to the issue of HIV testing, scaling up for the regional response um, focusing on the first 90 of the 1990-90 targets. Um, next slide.
And by way of background, we know that the global epidemic has claimed fewer lives. We've made significant advances since the inception of the, uh, the start of the epidemic. We've seen that the global ep epidemic has, over the period, over the last few years, claimed fewer lives since the 1990s. We've seen, to a large extent, due to the expansion of the antiretroviral therapy, reduced global numbers of persons dying from age-related causes. Um, for, falling from the, the 2005 figure um, by some 45% to 2015. We've noted that um, according to your needs and WHO, estimates show that more than 18 million persons should have received antiretroviral therapy by the mid-2016. Uh, next slide. Closer to home, the region and has recorded in similar fashion a decline in the person level, number of persons living with HIV and AIDS from just over 333,000 in 2010 to 285, 286,000 in 2015. Um, in Haiti, the incidence of new infections have declined by some 59% according to information from your needs and country reports. Um, we've seen deaths decline by 43% for the last five years. The bulk of the epidemic continues to be centered around um, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Cuba, accounting for some 87% of persons with HIV and AIDS. Um, but we have seen positive trends in terms of the AIDS-related deaths continuing its downward trend. Um, in some cases, static in most countries. New infections, of course, um, have been recorded. Some we've recorded some increases in in new in new infections in Jamaica and in Cuba between 2010 and 2015. And as it relates as it relates to persons with HIV receiving treatment, um, less than 50% are presently receiving treatment in the region of Cuba, reaching the highest level in terms of coverage at 69% and Jamaica, 32%. By way of, of, of background, countries have therefore committed to ending the epidemic as a public health, um, dealing with ending the epidemic as a public health threat by 2030, cons consistent with the goals of the fast track and by extension the 1990 goals as articulated by UNAIDS where by 2020, 90% of all persons with HIV and AIDS will have their HIV status known. 90% of all diagnosed with, HIV, with a HIV infection will have received sustained ARTs and 90% of all persons receiving ARTs would have a terrible viral suppression. These are central to the 1990 goals and this is the basis upon which the presentation will be formulated. We will be focusing on the first of the 90s, which is looking at the percentage of persons diagnosed um, with the focus on HIV testing. So by way of presentation content, we're gonna ask roughly six, we're gonna address six issues. Where do we stand in light of the, the background that we've just, that I've just presented? What are the challenges towards achieving the target? A bit of a retake on the rationale for the 90% diagnose, the, the first 90. We're going to look at the targets and, and the cascades uh, for key population as it relates to the, the first 90. And then address briefly some of the, what we see as the key prerequisites as captured in the literature and by experiences based on what we've engaged in and the experiences of countries. Um, what we see as the key prerequisites for achieving the first 90. And I would end with a few, a bit of reflection, a few points uh, based on, on what we've taken, what we've addressed over the last the next uh, few minutes. In terms of where we stand, um, bearing in mind that the 1990-90 target, regionally, we've achieved 70% as it relates to the first 90 persons who are diagnosed um, as relates to specific countries, 
we see a uh, next slide that identifies specific targets that, that have been reached by countries, and these are varying years. Um, as high as 83% in Barbados, 85% in Jamaica, and this is as it relates to the first 90. They are 67%. So we see some degree of success, but of course, we are still identifying some way to go. What are some of the challenges towards achieving those targets? These challenges can be looked at from a supply side and from the demand side, as well as addressing some of the external factors. Flagging some of the supply side challenges that, and by supply side, we're going to be looking specifically at the health system, on the side of the health systems, we, a number of, 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 of points speak to, among other things, the reluctance to treat with persons with HIV and AIDS and key populations at risk as it relates to the healthcare providers. We've seen, based on the studies that we've done in the region, instances of practices such as double gloving when interacting with clients um, based on a perceived fear of HIV exposure, particularly for the more invasive um, interventions. Um, we have reports of cases of staff expressing significant degrees of, of unwillingness to engage with persons with HIV and key population as it relates to providing treatment and support and care at the institutions. We have also reported um, reports of case of staff disclosing the status of, of persons with HIV to others among the staff as examples of instances where we we see that there are there is still some way to go. We have some 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 there are some areas to cover some while we've made significant improvement and we've seen and noted that within health facilities we've seen and, and cases have been reported of healthcare professionals going the extra mile in providing support for persons with HIV and AIDS. We're still seeing unacceptably high levels of uh, stigma uh, and, and discrimination illustrated in these um, initiatives. So, um, as it relates to the health system support to the requirements, the universal testing, we see we have instances of stockouts and um, laboratory support systems. While significant improvements have been noted to a large extent due to the work of the CMLF, Caribbean Med Labs Foundation, and their continued work at strengthening laboratory systems throughout the region, this is a process that still will need continuing support um, and buying at both the public and private sector. From the demand side, um, as users of the service, we see a reluctance in accessing their services due to fear of disclosing their status to partners. And these are some of the reasons that we can identify for the shortcoming as it relates to the, the first 90. Um, a number of, of instances and studies that were done both regionally and internationally have pointed to um, fear of disclosing status to partners, particularly, and family members, members etc., for fear of, of reprisals of one way or the other. Or the other. Um, fear of um, and issues around acts of discrimination when visiting facilities, those have been reported from both healthcare workers and clients. Um, where even from clients we have, based on studies that we've done, a level of, of um, apprehension about persons sharing facilities, persons who are HIV positive, accessing medical, their, their medicines and, and accessing treatment at, at their at facilities at where they attend. Um, the whole perception about the quality of care at health facilities are also been identified as a major barrier um, and lack of awareness of the services available across the health system. These are some of the things from the client side that tend to dissuade or drive a, a reluctance towards accessing treatment, uh, sorry, testing at facilities. Locating that within the broader, what we call the external or macro factors, where we've seen, as um, a number of you would know, a significant shift in the donor landscape 
over the last five years, we've seen a, a, a significant depletion of donor agencies that would have traditionally provided support to the regional response. We are now, uh, within the last year, um, seeing the last of the two or three years where we have the U.S. funding agencies uh, providing support to a number of programs. In spite of that, um, we still have, have, by way of, of dependent, a significant amount of dependence on international assistance uh, for some key um, activities, particularly around treatment and care. And so that is something that is, is a particular um, concern to us in the region. And in, um, side by side with that, we have our domestic economic environment um, fairly weak and um, as reflected in the economic situation in a number of our countries. And um, so there is a bit of concern as to the ability of the national response or the national um, national coffers local and domestic funding sources to take up the battle, so to speak. So if we step back a bit and identify, again, the rationale for 90% being diagnosed, the goal here is rooted in the principle of universal testing and treating in, to a large extent, test and treat. Objective really is to identify persons early in their infection, start treatment, so that it becomes virally suppressed. And essentially it's centered around improving the health outcomes of persons who do not know their status and reducing HIV transmission. Now we've, we've once, once we look at the cascade, the, the typical cascade, which is the basis for the identification of the 1990-90, for countries in the region, um, our focus continues to be on the key populations where the epidemic continues to be concentrated. And so drawing on the PEPFAR document that we, in 2015 we're making reference to here, an epidemic control model. Um, this model actually replicates the, the cascade approach, but it applies it to key, to key population. And so what we have here is a model that provides a, a data-driven approach that allows for the monitoring and flow of key populations across the cascade for, through the entire continuum from prevention, care, and treatment. And so the linkages between interventions for KP are very frequently inadequate. We found are inadequate in every stage of the continuum of prevention, care, and treatment. And very often these are driven by the very factors we've identified early on. Um, that KPs, key populations face in accessing services. Very often, this is reflected in outreach programs that refer to KP members um, and refer them to testing and counseling. But also, very often, these things they miss their mark because, of course, uh, sufficient numbers of those reached never actually get to testing. Those that test negative may only test once or infrequently despite ongoing risk. Those diagnosed positive may leave the testing site without referral to treatment and care. The issue of loss to follow up continues to be a characteristic of, of, of the landscape. Um, it's very common across the continuum and, and very often contributing to, to uh, the increased burden and, of course, as it relates to both mobile, mobility and mortality. So it, it, it's clear that, that there's a need for continuous re engagement. Of the and and before and this this it is critical here that, and and this is where the, the model provides an interesting perspective because what this model does is it, it, it highlights the importance of continuous in re-engagement of HIV negative KPs through the application of preventative approaches that includes among other things um, your rights-based peer-led behavior counseling condom use lubricants regular HIV testing, sexually transmitted infection services, harm reduction intervention, and PrEP where appropriate. The objective is to minimize at, at, at the level before persons are actually diagnosed and, and engage in a, a preventative approach that would be done particularly for the negative KPs um, and partners of 
of KPs who are positive for, by extension. So in, as it relates to some of the prerequisites for achieving the first 90, we, we can flag a few of them. They, they, they are classified based on systems, health systems, and some of them are, are specific to, to broader systems be, beyond the health, but it's the social support and mechanism, and some of the community-based systems that are required for, as we see, key prerequisites for achieving the first 90. Um, including, we, we, we feel that a key prerequisite is a need for some degree of flexibility in the delivery system that would allow for clinics at uh, HIV testing to be taken out of your formal hospital, hospital and clinic systems um, and, and taken out of, of that formal system. When I say taken out, I should say complementing what is happening at those, uh, in, at those facilities into community-based um, entities without compromising standards and quality. It's important that, that we maintain this, the, the quality and the standards that are a key feature of what happens within the formal health um, services, health systems at the level of the clinics and the hospital systems. And while decentralized systems very often may not necessarily yield um, the, the throughput as it relates to persons within a community going closer to home. In an environment that is still characterized by high levels of stigma and discrimination, persons, persons are going to be willing to go to another facility in another village or another community away from where they live. And so the idea of taking, um, spreading, so to speak, the, the delivery system into community-based um, organizations provides an opportunity and some level of flexibility. Uh, it is important that that HIV diagnose that that the HIV diagnosed individuals start ARTs as close to diagnosis as possible. The literature is pretty much well. Um, there is a significant amount of coverage on on that. The issue of counseling and counseling and support, of course, is going to be critical for those persons who are asymptomatic as well as those who <clears throat> may not feel ready to start taking treatment indefinitely. And so the support systems are of critical importance. Um, consistent supply of antiretroviral drugs will be, of course, a key feature of any initiative that is geared towards ensuring that testing is, uh, the throughput that we're expecting is consistent. Any perception as to the, 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 the lack of supply or the inconsistent supply of, of, of drugs will de deter persons from testing. And so the aim is to keep persons on treatment so that they can be virally suppressed. It is critical that there be a consistent supply of drugs. Um, the, the, the presence of at least three lines of drug therapy and the cadre of staff trained to provide the relevant services of courses of critical importance. There are implications in terms of resource needs um, because these drugs are very often four to five times higher than in cost than the, your first line drugs. Um, continuing in terms of prerequisites, it is important, we see the importance of strong information systems to guide the flow of data from both client and health systems <clears throat> and ensure that there are linkages across both parties, particularly if we are ensuring that a mechanism for understanding and, and, and dealing with some of the misinformation um, and myths as it relates to what the health system is doing or not doing, um, it is important that these things be, be addressed. Uh, linkages to other clinical and support systems and services are of critical importance, particularly as we bring persons into the cascade and for persons who are diagnosed positive to ensure that they continue to, to, to test and stay on regimes and as well those persons who are <coughs> outside of the, the, the loop. It speaks therefore to strong and continued strengthening of KP focused civil society organizations as the first point of contact for key populations and to ensure that these organizations continue to be structured in a way that would align themselves with the established agencies at the level of the state and other non-state actors. <coughs> Sorry. 
This highlights the need for, <clears throat> as well for a strong collaboration between all implementing agents. And again, we're speaking of the state and civil society and the importance of information flow to facilitate that. And of course, central to all of this is the need for a strong supportive environment driven by supportive laws for human rights, um, zero tolerance for violence to ensure that the landscape continues to be based on an enabling environment. As we, I, as we draw close to my time, I, I know I expect Shanti to, to signal me anytime now. Um, a few points of reflection. The factors that continue to result in key populations and other key persons in which HIV avoiding and evading those key pillars of the cascades are still rooted in structural drivers, the structural drivers of the epidemic. These are poverty, inequity, lack of opportunities, reinforced by weak institutions, social capital, and reflected in a type of wealth seeking behavior that persons will engage in to survive. And very often these behaviors undermine and expose them to further vulnerabilities, to further risks, and thereby tend to reinforce the cycle of poverty and inequity. And so it is of importance that we understand the, that, that, that these structural drivers should be part and parcel of an ongoing engagement as we continue to ensure that the drip from the pipe is closed off and, and minimize the number of persons who are at risk and persons who will engage in activities that will put them at risk for infection. Engaging in these drivers will ensure that persons test negative and avoid infection. Those who are positive will stay enrolled in care and it minimizes the risk of drug resistance strains as we push towards fast tracking or, or response to the epidemic. It is of importance that we continue to ensure uh, that we stay faithful to addressing those structural drivers. If we, are to, if we have to move to achieving the, the goals of, of fast tracking, the fast track initiative and the 1990-90 initiatives. Presently, with the rapid donor, changing donor landscape, coupled by the constrained domestic situation, that speaks to a need as well for greater horizontal approaches. Um, utilizing existing support systems, systems that are already in place to provide social support to persons in need, strengthening these systems to achieve the goals set out by reducing the impact of the epidemic, recognizing that HIV is but one of a number of challenges faced by the most vulnerable in our society. And so strong collaboration with state private sector agents and the traditional civil society organizations are of critical importance, particularly with the existing landscape, so that we maximize the reach of these institutions that are mandated to so do, and that we enhance the efficiency of their and, and of their role in reaching to those vulnerable and key populations. We have to also ensure that efforts are made to strengthen the institutional framework at all stages of the cascade. What do I mean by this? Very often we engage in a significant amount of strengthening, but strengthening is very, the strengthening efforts and capacity building efforts are very often housed in, with, with individuals. And while those efforts are laudable and needed, they, they must be also rooted in strengthening of the institutional framework the organizations and the systems within which individuals operate. It is only by doing that that we will achieve a true sustainable response to the epidemic, that we'll have the, the, the core the principles in place and the core activities, strategies in place that will allow for continuity and deepening of, the, of our initiatives as we face the new challenges ahead. It is also these, these initiatives that are rooted in institutions and systems will allow for consistency in our, in our approaches. It will facilitate monitoring and evaluation of these, these initiatives. It will ensure efficiency and effectiveness and sustainability of the effort in the final analysis. I thank you. Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. Um, I think that was a, quite a lot of food for thought, and you did really well with time, Roger. Thank you again. Um, I'm happy that, you know, in your presentation, you did allude to the fact that in the region, we're seeing a decline in HIV and AIDS, and particularly so um, in countries like Haiti. But at the same time, we have seen some new infections in some of our other countries. Um, and on the, on the first 90, I think um, we are in a good place of 70% of that first 90, but we've seen also that there are some countries who've been doing relatively well. Um, and so you've highlighted Jamaica, Trinidad, Ghana, and a few other countries with more than 80% um, um, testing. I, I think it was interesting how you've, you've you've looked at the issue of, of the challenges from a supply side and a demand side, but what really struck me was that the fact that stigma and discrimination is so pervasive that it found itself in both the supply um, and the demand, the, the demand side of, of challenges. Um, thanks again for, for focusing us once more on, on the need to prioritize key population and for highlighting PEPFAS 3.0. Um, framework is a good framework for assisting us with that prioritization. Um, and again, I think you've given us quite quite a lot of food for thought in terms of what the prerequisites are. Um, and and I, I like the way you've approached this using a health systems approach. So looking at supply chain um, system, looking at a model of care and how do we incorporate a community response within that model, the capacity of our health workforce, the health system, health information systems, and of course, the critical nature of partnership and collaboration to get to that 90. Um, and finally, I'm really very pleased that um, in your reflection quite a bit, Roger, thank you again, but I'm happy that you started out your reflection looking at the social determinants of health and looking at poverty and inequity because I think those are fundamental issues that we need to address um, should we get to the 90-90-90 of testing, of retention on, on ART and on um, viral suppression. I, I also noted that um, on the slide that you had on challenges that supply chain came up and laboratory strengthening came up and I want to say that um, we will address supply chain and laboratory um, support to the, re to the response in another webinar. Um, and so I'll move on at this point, but I'm reminding participants that if you have any questions, please type them in and we'll have a question and answer segment at the end. Our final speaker this afternoon is Quincy McEwen. He's the president of the Ghana Trans United. Uh, the Guyana Trans United has been making significant contributions in reaching the key, key and vulnerable populations in Guyana, and particularly that of the transgender community. Um, I now invite Quincy to share the experiences, strategies, and work of the Guyana Trans United in reaching the key populations with HIV testing. Um, over to you, Quincy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. From Guyana Trans United, 102 Thomas Street, City. Quincy, you need to press the arrow to the right. Down at the bottom, just press it to the right. The mission is together we will work for the better of all, sharing and care for each other. United we stand in one dream, working for the enhancement of our success and fostering an enabled environment for a proud community of which we are.
Hi, Quincy. Um, we're really getting a strong echo, so if you have other equipment on, could you mute them, please? Sure. 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 So we go with the structure of the organization, the board of trustees, the director, the medical person, admin, admin, finance, Project coordinator at the same level, social worker, period, counselor testing, period. Wow. The song, Fila. Or is different, perhaps, in one in this way, two for the time. Quincy, it is better now, so you can proceed. Okay, so we deal go back with the structure of the organization, the board of director, the prevention, we continue from the prevention coordinator, finance, social worker, counselor test and peer educator. Are going to change the slides? Investment achieved the first 90 for GTU is the community mapping and the first update. The I-15 invention is mobile in the reach, WhatsApp, and social media platforms, Facebook. The community-based HIV testing and referrals, peer-driven outreach venues, streets and venues, the data-driven, the yield and the uptakes, the quarterly peer educators outreach assessments, contact and partner arm um, tracking, home testing, performance incentive strategy for staff. Mm -hmm. yeah, Our next slide is showing our ta individual targets. You meet through intervention. The moderator can assist in changing the slides, please. Okay, thanks. Our target is for MSM, 712. Our achievement today for the first quarter is 332 MSM. We fought a 7% reach for a female sex worker, a target of 546. Our reach of today as 347 percentage, 64 percentage, and for our trans target, 190. Our reach of today, 193 for the 9% reach. HTC uptake in outreach for FY7, FY16. Meeting prevention is 3,480. Act 7 HTC. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Individual counseling and testing for HIV February 2017 is 712. For MSM, we have meet um, 375 and whereby 52 of percentage. For female sex workers, 546, and we have 388, which in thereby is 71 percentage. For the transgender, it's 190, and we have reached 101, whereby they were 53 percentage. Mm -hmm. 
HTC FY16 we as targets we look at our target for FY16 so we meet three in prevention we meet 3480 we were able to test 1798 for FY17 we as reached in prevention 1707 1,007, sorry. For testing, we have test 772 persons. Is distribution of the HCT beneficiary. For the MFM, We look in the age group where you accept the most testing we were able to work with. In the F for MSM, we look from 19, 15 to 19, 15 to 34 for MSM the uptake. We look at those are the area where we found more were accepting the testing. MSM. So we could safely say from 15 to 34 is our MSM target area. For the female sex worker, we look the same pattern we see. We see from 15 to 34 is the most accepting. And we look a bit changing for transgender women. And we see from 20. 20 to 29 is the accepted rate. The next slide. Cases seen by GTU are from are from younger age groups. Predominantly, 76 of those counseled and tested were 35 years. Among HCC refusal was 71 percentage were 35 years. MSM 70 percentage. Female sex workers 72 percentage and transgender 77 percent. So. Even though we were looking at a particular age group where we were able to capture them to do testing, when it comes to the person that diagnosed, we see at a different age group. So we look at in the 40 to 44 is the most highest rate in the MSM that's able to be HIV found to be HIV positive. That's what the slide is showing us differently. And for TG, we see within 15 to 24. We were able to find 12 persons for the first quarter of the year. Linked four out of 12. We weren't able to get anybody on art as yet. So we didn't have virus suppression. Conclusions increasing younger phase of the epidemic require more youth focused strategy, improved collaborations with gatekeepers and key informants to gather hotspot information real time, refresher training to improve knowledge base and sharing of performance results with team quarterly support, supportive um, supervision to improve service quality, more incentive use of the ICT networking and in rich strategy. And that's our presentation and why we decided to share the presentation with somebody young because we believe the youth is our future. All right, great. Um, thank you so much.
Um, thank you so much, Quincy, for sharing. Um, I think, like I said, I think this is great work that's that's going on from the Guyana Trans United. Um, and I've asked, I, I, I'm not sure that I'm seeing any questions, but um, if, if there are any questions, please feel free to begin to type those in. Um, and I, I probably want to throw the first question, and this one is to you, Quincy. Um, I noticed that you had a refusal rate of 7 to 1 percent um, for persons less than 35 years of age. And so it's really that young group of, of people that we're talking about. And a refusal of 7 to 1 percent in my mind seems to be really high. Um, any thoughts on that? In the meanwhile, Quincy is getting ready to answer the question. If there are any other questions from participants, um, please, please feel free to type them in. Shanti, I think we also need to note, thank you very much, Quincy, for the presentation, but I think we also need to note and have some correlation between the fact that the younger MSM were refusing in terms of the refusal rate and the fact that you had what appeared to be a higher um, incidence among the older. So it, it would suggest to me that if you, that that is skewed, because in, if in fact you were able to get the young MSM to be tested, we might be seeing a different kind of result. Um, great, thank you, Derek. That was an excellent add-on to the question. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it over to Quincy. Um, Quincy, while you think about that question, we have a question from Kimberly Ball from Bermuda. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, she's asking who pays for prep for clients. So, Doc, even though that we look at the age group and refusal of tests, it's sort of a fact that many things contribute to a young person and not wanting to be tested. Many times people are live within, especially from the community, the key population that we deal with as key population, especially transgender, MSM, and sex workers. Many times they share homes, share families, and because of that, because they not feel confident enough, sometimes it deter them to doing a test because of the result, because they know the risk factor that they into high risk factors. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Sh Shanti, before you go on, I just want to make sure that we are clear in terms of what Quincy said. Are you saying, Quincy, that because of the fear of being stigmatized, of being rejected by family members, that there is a reluctance for the younger MSM or key population members to be tested. Sure, yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Derek, and thanks, Quincy. Um, I have a question here from Kimberly Ball for you, Roger. Um, and Kimberly is asking um, the same question I asked um, Who is paying for a prep? Um, and secondly, how are we trying to reduce refusal rates so as to achieve the first 90? Hi, Roger, are you still with us? Uh, so, Shanti, I think we have a few um, NAP managers on, and I don't know if they may wish to respond to the question that is being posed. Um, given the discussion that we had within the recent National AIDS Program Managers and Key Partners meeting, which was held in, in March, I don't know, I saw Ayan is on and a, a couple others, and, and, and maybe Kimberly can indicate whether this is something that has started in, um, in Bermuda, and if it has not, is there an intention? Is there a policy that addresses it? And, and, and this is the type of discussion, hopefully, that it can be hope. We may not have the time to address all of that, um, 
but of course this has to be guided by policy. Right. Uh, and thank you, thank you, Derek, for that. I, in fact, I see a really long lineup of questions, um, and I think we're running out of time. So, what I can do, Roger, are you still there? If Roger is still there, I can ask that Roger take one or two of the questions. I see some questions from Valerie. Um, the question from Valerie to Roger is that it is critical that a national laboratory policy that CMLF LF initiated on the Global Fund Round 9 is continued to ensure that key population testing sites and facilities and national testing sites are made more user-friendly for key populations and are supported and monitored to ensure quality of HIV rapid testing. Um, so I, I figure that's not a question but a comment from you, Valerie. Um, thank you very much. Um, I know we're over our time, and maybe in the interest of time, we will make note of all of the questions. Um, we'll send them out to the, the presenters, um, and we'll drop some answers, and we'll send the answers out um, to the persons who would have submitted that question, if that's acceptable. And any thoughts, Derek? I know we're over our time. Okay, what, what I wanted is to respond to Valerie's question because <laughs> Valerie has made this case, you know, to the COSA, she's made it to everyone. And again, I think it's important for her to continue to make this case. In my recent discussion with the Prime Minister for St. Kitts and Nevis, who is the chair of PANCAP, uh, we did have this discussion in terms of addressing the gaps and uh, I am going to be sending him a further brief on the issue, but at the moment the CARICOM Secretariat is also engaged given that they have made a decision that they have to be actively involved in addressing the challenge that has been created from the PEPFAR 2.0 pivot and how do they manage that. And so to be able to use not just the Secretary General, but the different organs of CARICOM to be able to make the case um, for increased HIV investment at the national level. We are currently working with Global Fund, PEPFAR, Pan, um, PAHO, and the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for HIV AIDS to conduct a series of national high-level meetings with ministers of finance, um, heads of government, ministers of justice, etc., at the private sector and that will be more than likely the second half of October in order to be able to continue to address this, this challenge that we have and how do we fill the gaps that are being created because of the withdrawal of the funding. Yeah, um, that's, that's excellent. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for your inputs. Um, we do have a few more questions, but I think, like I said, um, uh, we'll pull the questions together, get the panelists to do some responses, and we will email those out for persons. We're a little bit over time. Um, and so we'll close off for now. I wanted to say um, a special thanks to all of you on behalf of, of PANCAP and on behalf of the participants to thank all of our presenters, to thank you, Derek, for your leadership to the response. Um, Roger and um, Quincy for your presentations, well done. Thank you so much for investing in this webinar and in my mind by extension to the partnership um, and thanks for sharing. I think it has been great, it has been our, it's our first webinar and I think it's excellent and so I wish to thank all of you who would have joined us. Um, as a reminder, the webinar was recorded and this will be posted on the PANCAP website. We have a series of upcoming webinars, so please do join us at our next one. The announcement will follow shortly. Um, also, please do stay engaged with us um, uh, with the regional response. Follow us on our social media platforms. I'm putting a plug here for Timothy. Follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter. Um, thanks again, everyone. Thank you so much, and have a great day, everybody.